Uh, I'll make a couple of comments that get back to both of those questions. Um, we started out with three or four surge valves, and um, we grew up to like 32 surge valves now. Um, we use computerized hole selection on all of our fur irrigated acres, as well as our rice. Um, it's one of those things, it's a new piece of technology, and in my mind, um, I'm probably not as, as computer savvy as maybe what um, some other people in our operation are, including my brother-in-law. Yeah, so I go a little bit apprehensive, you know, just in the back of my mind, something's going to go wrong. Something's not going to work right. going to mess something up. I know how to irrigate, you know, the standard way without surge valves. Um, but with a little bit of time, a little bit of training, you visit with Cruz or some of the other people he's talked about or visiting with Chris, um, pipe planter, it's really not that hard. I said, we set up right at um, about 7,000 acres um, spring of 2015 on pipe planter. And again, that's, that's all of our heavy ground, uh, fur irrigated soybeans, uh, all of our fur irrigated corn, um, all of our rice. Um, it really doesn't take a lot of time. The one thing that I will say, one thing that we really did learn um, that uh, we will do for 2016 is we kind of went in and made some, some assumptions within pipe planter as far as the elevation where our poly pipe lays. Um, we went in and made an assumption that it, you know, it's here at the riser and it's here at the end of the run. We made some assumptions there. Making those assumptions can cause you some grief with respect to what the true elevation is. If it's, if it's a taller elevation or it's going up a slope, um, you've got some drag there on that water and you just you physically can't get as much water down in the end as what you want. You can fix all of that if you truly know your elevation and, and there's, it's really easy now to go in and, and basically cut out elevation or insert cell data with respect to has elevation into pipe planter that will calculate your elevation for you. Uh, and it makes it so much more clean when you go to irrigate because it takes into account that elevation and it, it basically tells you what size a hole to punch throughout that entire line. So if you're going up a hill, you may not think you are. You may not think a foot over or even six inches over three quarter of a mile long run makes a big difference. It makes a huge difference. So that's the one thing that we really learned is that we have to do a better job of truly knowing what our elevation is along that pipe versus just going in and, and making an assumption. Um, that helped a lot. Two other things I'll say, and it, it kind of gets back to uh, y'all's questions. Um, <clears throat> we have one field that um, it's about three quarter of a mile run. It's only about a thousand foot long. So it's a long, narrow field. It's not real deep, but it's really, really long. We have one riser. On one end of it, we put a surge valve on it. Uh, that well, when we're just running that field alone, it'll pump right around. Um, 1400 GPM and one thing that we figured out with with a uh, with a surge valve is when you have a feeder line that's running that long of a run uh, it gets back to your point talking about how many hours to set up on your advance and your soak cycles and, and I talked to Jason a lot you know about, okay we're gonna we're gonna plug it in at 14 and then we're gonna watch it and then we're gonna see if we need to adjust accordingly but one thing those surge valves do is that when you plug in that number it's gonna have a number of, of cycles it's gonna have how many times does it go through a full cycle? It's going back and forth. Once it goes on, on one side and it swaps over to the other side and it finishes that side and goes back over to the original side, that's one cycle. Well, a lot of times, a lot of hours were set on a default of six cycles. And what we figured out is when we have an extremely long run, it takes forever to charge that feeder line, that supply line. It takes forever. By the time it got charged up, it was swapping over. And so we had to go in and reduce our number of cycles from six to four, and all it would really do is just water longer on each side. But it takes into account that the time it takes to charge your supply line. Uh, the other point that, that somebody was making about a long run, are you better off in a situation like that, or long term, are you better off putting an underground pipe, putting a riser down halfway down the field? In that field I was talking about, we went in after we got the crop out, we put a riser in halfway down the field. It just makes, it's just a long way to push water. It's a long, long way. Even with a surge valve, which we love, it's a long way to push water. So, I don't know if I muddy the waters. I don't know if I told something that wasn't true, but that's what we found. Um, <coughs> when Jason and I talked about this session, um, there was a number of different ways that, and don't, don't get lost in all this because it's, it's a lot of stuff up there. Um, 
we talked about some things that, that we could we could present, and, and one of the things that we did in 2015 that um, really opened our eyes. And I know there's uh, I know there's at least one other speaker uh, at this meeting talking about fur irrigator or road rice. Uh, we we did some road rice in 2015, and we really did it as a as a combination of where the field was was sitting. Had a lot of corn around it, and had a block of rice, and about three quarters of the field is set up on a tenth grade, so we go in and put ladies on it. Heavy ground, heavy clay, good rice ground. But then there was a small portion of that field. Um, picture showing up. There we go. There's a small portion of this field that we had to go in and put contour levees. We don't we don't like contour levees. Um, we we like all of ours on straight levees. So we have corn down here. All this is all of this is corn. This is rice. Uh, this is levee rice and, and this is rice over here, so it makes perfect sense for us. I'm not going to go in here and plant 20 acres of soybeans that's got corn and rice all around it. Uh, it's just difficult to manage. So we'll, just, we'll go in here and we'll look at, at road rice on this. We went in with a mindset of I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to increase my yield for road rice over what I'm yielding for my levee rice. I want to look at road rice for other reasons. One, this reason, simplicity, and two, some other reasons to where um, I've got rice all around this. We've already got crew managing all of this. Um, let's look at some road rice and let's go into it with a mindset of really from a learning experience. What can we do to grow road rice? Um, I'll talk very briefly about this and I'm going to hit a few high points. Uh, we planted this to XL 745. Uh, our planting date was the middle of April. Our seeding rate was 24 pounds to the acre. Bottom line, our herbicide program was the same for our road rice as what it was for our levy rice. We didn't do anything different with respect to weed control. Uh, we went in with an application in command behind the planter. First application of the new path, because it was road rice, um, I went ahead and added a little bit more command. I think it was half a pint of command to that early new path application. It was perfectly labeled. And then we came back with a clear path permit pre-flood and then uh, we had to come back in with some blazer on all of it post-flood a half a pint before coffee week. Uh, fertility, there's really three facets I think when you talk to, whether it be Jason or you talk to some of the wheat scientists or the pathologists or the fertility folks, is in a road rice situation where I obviously have rice that's not in a continuous flood. And so yeah, all of us are scared to death, including myself, of weed control when I don't have a continuous flood. Secondly, disease issues. Obviously it was chief blight and some other things. Um, we don't want something, we don't want the water level to get down to the point to where we can have things move up the plant, you move all the way up the plant and blow the head out, so things like sheath blight and other things. So diseases are an issue. In my mind, if I pick the right variety and we can do a decent job of managing this, um, and we do a good job of weed control, I'm not so much concerned about weed control and disease control as I am fertility. I still, in my mind, my biggest concern would be nitrogen management. How much nitrogen am I losing in a situation like this to where <clears throat> this portion of the road rice block had a continuous flood on it? We stopped up the two culverts, we walked away to water this, and we'll get this in a second. This portion of the road rice basically was like this it had a continuous flood. This portion of the road rice um, did not have a continuous flood on it. So, nitrogen, to me, in my mind, is my biggest concern is how am I going to manage nitrogen? in a road rice situation. Um, I'll get into some specifics as we kind of go through, but I want to start with, with yield. You really can't see some of these numbers, but I'll, I'll talk about it here in a second. This is your levy rice. <coughs> this is your road rice. Now, what stands out when we look at this picture? Road rice didn't do nearly as well. When you look at the picture, when you look at this, and, when, and, I, and I, shame on me for not taking pictures of this rice. We had a horrible stand issue up here in this block of road rice. We did everything wrong, in my mind, of how we, how we should have and how we will do our road rice in 2016. We made kind of a last minute decision to grow this to road rice. It was still road up. It goes from extremely heavy up here to really light down here. Remember, I've got corn here. So we went in and we knocked the rows down and run a field cultivator, run our diamond hair over it, and tried to get it as smooth as we possibly could. But we planted this um, with our planter going back and forth like this. When I got up into here, um, I had rice seed that was anywhere from that deep that's on top of the old rows to rice seed, rice seed that was that deep down in the middles. Had a horrible, horrible stand up in here. On the sandier end of the field, I had a lot better standing. When you ride the combine and you look at them, there were holes out here 
in this where we, we just didn't have plants. We didn't have rice crop. Down here we had a lot better stand. Now, when we first started out, my thought process is I, I'm going to have a lot better yield up here on the heavier ground than I am down here on the light ground. It just kind of goes to say. It's what we typically would expect. We had a bad rice stand up here, and that's why our yields were off up here on this top end of the field. This field averaged 179. All right. What I did was we had some glyphosate drift go across this whole farm from a neighbor in this block down here. I, I took this little piece out, so that's not taken into account. This rice blocked the whole field yielded 179. Right. Now, <coughs> if we look at the rice yield for just the road rice section, we were right at 166. Right? So this rice obviously didn't yield quite as well as what our levy rice did. Now, when you start taking into account some different things, where I had a thin stand, my yields were down to can't read on the screen. Um, 151. On this section where I had a thin stand, this rice down here yielded 176. So that's what a thin stand did for us um, on our road rice. A lot of this yield reduction is due to a thin stand. The other thing that, you, that we wanted to look at, I looked at this a little bit, I did see a yield difference between where I had a constant flood and versus where I didn't have a constant flood. Uh, when you take into account this versus this, I'm looking at 176 uh, versus a little over 150 bushels. A lot of it's due to thin stand. Now, some other things that we look at, and we look at just the levy portion, we're at 176 down here, 156 here, 189 up here. You start looking at the yield differences, man, there's, there's no way that I can make levy dry, or excuse me, road rice work from a yield standpoint. It's just, you know, you're looking at a yield difference there that there's, there's no way. Now, a couple of things to take into mind, and I don't know how everybody else does this, but when I take into account this is 189 bushels, when we, you look at our yield monitor data, that's basically harvested acres. It does not take into account my levies. So what we do is we'll get a yield of 189 bushels and then when my wife gets done with it, who's the CPA in our operation, the TSA takes into account the levies. We pay rent on the levies. We, we basically farm the levies like everything else. We just don't get a yield off of them. We didn't yield 189 bushels uh, to the acre on <clears throat> that, uh, the levy rice section. I think we were really right at 179. All right. <coughs> so. We boil all the yields down and we look at our road rice, we had a poor stand, we were 151. Our road rice, uh, we had a good stand, we were 176. Our levied rice, when we take into account the levies, we're at 179. So we go into this with a mindset of, my mindset is that if I can get my road rice to yield within three to five bushels, let's say, give or take, of my levied rice, I feel like I can make road rice work. Am I going to go out there and plant 2,000 acres of road rice? No, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. Am I going to plant some road rice in 2016 on some, on some fields that I really couldn't grow rice to? It's heavy ground. It's got a lot of water, um, but it's not straight, set up to straight levy. Uh, and it's next to a big block of levied rice. We're already going to be there at least once a day from a manager standpoint. Yeah, there's some places I can make road rice work, and I feel like there's some things that we've learned that we can make road rice work when we put and if we can get the yield within three to five bushels, we can make it work. All right. Some other things that we did learn and some things that we've done going into to this year, 2016, is um, in our situation, especially on our heavy ground, I don't feel like spring tillage is really an option, getting road rice ground ready to go to plant road rice in the spring. Spring tillage is, we all, all of those of us that farm heavy ground, spring tillage on heavy ground is, is tough. Um, what we've done is we went in and we got all that area where we're going to plant road rice to. We got it all set up in the fall. We had it in the soybeans. We went in with our diamond disc care. We smoothed it up. We went in and we, and we took a 12-row toolbar and we've got some, um, uh, some, some real small shallow busters on it. We put those on a 76-inch pattern. And we went in and we basically created our furrows to irrigate that road rice in the fall. So now we can drop back in and we can plant our road rice stale seed bed and hopefully do a little bit better job of, uh, of getting the lead, excuse me, of getting the stand. All right. <coughs> this is probably the, the, the most important slide um, when I look at the economics of road rice, and I'll wrap it up with a few things. We'll start with seeding rate. Um, this again was planted to hybrid um, in 2015. 
Uh, what we're probably going to plant this year on our road rice is either going to be one, Clearfield 111 or Clearfield 163. Um, um, or not, excuse me, 163. Probably either Clearfield 111 or Clearfield 172. Um, in all likelihood, probably 111. And that is predominantly really from, um, for us, from a disease standpoint. Um, I'm going to pick a variety or a hybrid that has a good disease pattern, disease package to where I don't have to, I don't have to worry about a potential train wreck. Um, so this is what we did in 2015, uh, hybrid rice, 24 pounds of the acre. There's my seed cost per acre. My herbicide cost, again, I did the same thing on my road rice as I did my levy rice, it was $103 an acre. Fertility, I did the same thing on my road rice and my levy rice. Um, from a nitrogen standpoint, I was at $80 an acre. Fungicide, we didn't fungicide any of this rice. It hadn't been a rice in a long time. It didn't have any really any, uh, staring or glowing uh, bad disease issues. We didn't fungicide that block of rice. From a budget standpoint, I'm going to put a fungicide application in my budget, whether it's road rice or levy rice. Uh, I'm going to put a fungicide application in the budget no matter what. Water use. When I look at the water use on our road rice versus our levy rice, we save some money there from, a, from an irrigation standpoint. Um, <clears throat> I figured that in at, uh, from the water use standpoint. This is a cost advantage to the road rice of about $15 an acre. That's what that number is. That's my cost savings, if you will, when I compare my road rice to my levy rice. From a yield standpoint, we're 176 versus 189. We take into account the levies. Our, our yield went from 189 to 179. Um, you take that into account, I'm $16 disadvantage to road rice. So I've kind of washed these two out. I'm almost at even. When I look at my levy cost, and everybody in this room has got a different cost when it comes to building and destructing levees. You know, and, and there's numbers all over the board. Um, if you look at a lot of the university budgets, I don't feel like, in my opinion, they, they, that number is high enough when they, when they have a cost in there for developing levees because they're probably only going over the levees, constructing those levees maybe twice. We pulled our levees about five or six times, especially in our heavy ground. We're going to go over them and over and over and over them because we start out with boulders. And we finally get to the point there, and we're going to pack it down with our dual, and we'll rebuild it. So I don't think our cost that's in the university budget, in my opinion, is quite high enough. I think this number for us may be closer to $20 an acre. But I left it. I used the university's numbers to calculate this, and I'm about $15 an acre. All right? So with all that said, you take into account these economics, I feel like if I can get within three to five bushels on my road rice, I can make road rice work. Is there more management involved from, a, from maybe a watching that rice, scouting that rice? Probably so. Is there less management involved from a watering standpoint, from an installation of gate standpoint, from constructing and destructing levees? Yes. Um, the other nice part about this is on that field I showed you on that road rice section, all we had to do was drop in there, <coughs> run our diamond disc carrier over it, and row it up. On the other side, I had to tear levees down, disc levees, let them dry out, disc them again, and then go in and work the field a little bit more, and then pull my pull my, my rows up. And I did not take into account that on this budget. I didn't take any account think anything post harvest. So we're not under the, working under the premise that we're trying to increase our yields with road rice. We're in a situation where if I know I'm gonna plant a thousand acres of rice somewhere, and I've got a percentage of that that's not conducive for straight levy rice and I don't want to plant it to soybeans, um, I'm going to try to make road rice work. The other part of it too, those everybody in the room that, that are farmers, growers, that are looking at budgets, how many of you guys' rice budgets look a heck of a lot better than soybean budgets? I know ours do. Our soybean budgets are horrendous. <coughs> so with that said, it's a situation where um, I've got a good rice base on a farm, I'm going to have rice on it anyway, and I've got a percentage of that farm where I can grow road rice. I'm going to do everything I can to grow road rice and look at things like this and try to make road rice work. And if I can get within three to five bushels, we can make it work. The other part of this that I didn't mention, if I pick the right variety, I, can, I feel like I can do a good job of managing the disease on road rice. From a weed control standpoint, if we're really diligent, I get my airplane guy to fly when I tell him to go fly. Um, and, we, and we're very conscientious of neighbors and everything else. If I can do a good job of weed control, I don't stay up at night worried about weed control my road rice. Nitrogen is the one that I feel like is probably the one that I would stay awake at night thinking about. Uh, from that standpoint, the way we did our nitrogen is we put out 
an early shot of diapermonium sulfate. We came back in with an application of urea pre-flood and we came back in with another application of mid-season. What I would probably do, or what we probably will do this year on our nitrogen, we'll probably split that nitrogen application going from three applications to four. We'll probably split it up a little bit more. Just from the standpoint that I don't know how much nitrogen we're losing. I feel like we are losing more on our road rice than we are our levied rice. How much? I really don't know. Some people like Bobby Golden probably have a lot better handle on that than what I do. But you know, one application cost from an airplane, I feel like I can justify that and I'll probably split those nitrogen applications up. I may cut back on my pre-flood application a little bit and then time it with an irrigation event on my road rice, I'll probably go in and split those applications up, my, my post-flood applications from going from one to two. Try to spread my nitrogen out a little bit more through the course of the season. So. I threw a lot at you. <clears throat> um, I went through that, in my mind, somewhat quickly. Um, that's some of the things that we learned on road rice, and we'll have a, we'll go from about 20 acres of road rice to about 150 acres in 2016 um, on a farm that'll be all rice. So. Jason, I don't know if we have time for questions or not. <coughs> yes, sir. Um, when you were watering the rice, did you ever let it go dry? Uh, did you? How many times a week? <coughs> The, the way this worked out on that particular farm is we had, that farm we have uh, four wells that are all tied together. So we cover a lot of water across corn and rice all at the same time. What we had to do is we had to work around our corn acres we were irrigating. So what we would do is we would time it to where, okay, we're caught up on corn and we would irrigate our levied rice. And usually we'd, we'd irrigate it overnight, come back the next morning and if we, we had everything filled back up and we tried to do as good of a job with alternate wetting drying on that as we could. So we weren't keeping it slap full the whole time. We're letting it go down and filling it back up. What we would do is after we irrigated our levied rice, we'd run, jump over the pad and we'd irrigate our road rice. We wound up irrigating it. We were wet early. Then we got 4th of July, it didn't rain on us for three and a half months. So we found ourselves filling that back up or watering the road rice, if you will, about twice a week, especially after the 4th of July for about five weeks, give or take. Um, what kind of float did you have? And did you use a surge <coughs> valve on it too? And did you keep the top of your bed all the way saturated? Good question. On the, uh, the levee side, we did not have a surge valve on it just because of the way the field laid out. There was a pad that split the road rice and the levee rice, and we drove down that pad yeah. to get out and check our rice. Um, what we would do is we would, um, we would turn it on on our levee side, and then as soon as we got done, we'd turn it over on our, on our road side. We didn't have a surge valve on this. The levee side is on a tenth and a half slope. The road rice side, part of it's on a tenth, part's on two tenths, and it's you know it have wiggle levees and everything else. So keep the top of your beds wet. We were at, we we did a, I think we did a pretty decent job of keeping the tops of our beds fairly wet, except for the really top portion of that road rice section, and where you could still see those old beds out there, the tops of those beds. There were times when I walked out in and we would if we were caught up watering everything else, yeah. five minutes we had a well running. So, so no, we didn't do as good a job as I would like. I think we did a fair job. <coughs> How wide were your furrows on your row rice? They were, these were on 38s. We originally were going to plant that to soybeans, and we tried to tear those beds down as well as we could. In 2016, we'll be on 76s. So, and it's, it's extremely heavy, 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 heavy. But it's also almost flat. This was, you, know, you still see some rows out there. What we'll have for 2016, it's essentially flat with some furrows every 76 inches on heavier ground than this. So, so you feel like you'll have so I think we'll do a better, I think we'll, we learned a lot this year, 2015, I think we'll do a better job of keeping it soaked um, in 2016 uh, than what we did in 2015. The other part about it is I have one well that's devoted to my road rice. I don't have to split that well with anything else. So I feel like that will help us as well. Because there were times that we're three quarters away done watering corn and to Jason's point, you know, we've got it going, we don't want to stop, we want to finish. I had to wait a little bit longer than I wanted to to get the well to water this rice. You think you'll see any advantages in your follow-on crop with compactions <coughs> where you didn't have a, an interior levy to pull out? You know, sometimes irrigation water will hang up right there yeah. the next year. You watch your yield monitor and it'll have an effect yep. right where that levy used to be. Yeah. And you know, the next crop may make you money. As much, as, we, as much money as we spend, the times we spend, the diesel fuels we spend tearing down those levies, you still see it. The following year, you, you still see it. Sometimes they're greener where the levees were, you know, maybe because we got nitrogen hanging up there on the levees, but we still, we still see the remnant effects of those levees when we follow it with soybeans, no doubt. Yeah. 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 Ye
hopefully we'll be able to alleviate some of that with road rides. <coughs> All right? We good? All right. Thank you, guys. I'll be around. I know Jason will be around as well if y'all have any questions. <coughs>